um, the right button here. There we go. Online presentation and live presentation. Looks like we're getting ready here. I think we're going to get started here, Tyler. I'm going to okay. plug you in. All right. We know. You ready to go? Okay. Um, my name is Tyler Costantini. Call signs KB0PQP. I've uh, been a ham since 94 when I was 13. Um, I uh, in school for computer network technology and uh, later on went back to school for physics. Got an almost complete physics degree. It's kind of had to stop for some personal reasons, but uh, with the family, uh, illness in the family. Hope to go back here soon. Um, I got interested in electronics and uh, amateur radio at an early age and kind of continued that. I worked in uh, wireless industry, um, computer industry for over the years and uh, got very interested in this uh, electromagnetic pulse phenomenon about 2006 when North Korea tested their first uh, nuclear device and uh, really uh, got into it since. So uh, that's kind of my background. I think I'm just going to jump right in here. It's a lot easier uh, for me. <laughs> so all I can really see is myself here. So we're going to go ahead and, and dig right in. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. If anything isn't working right, just let me know. Um, find the right button. There we go. So this this talk tonight is going to be uh, EMP, amateur radio. Can we survive to pick up the pieces? Um, it's a variation on a talk I gave late 2015, I believe, for the Southeast Kansas Amateur Radio Club, which is my local club here. Um, and it's kind of gone around the Internet quite a bit, and I've got a lot of conversation about it. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and start here. We're going to dig right in. So uh, anybody remember this movie from 1983? It was War Games. Global thermonuclear warfare um, kind of set the stage tonight. First thing we've got to talk about if we're going to go over any of this stuff: um, electromagnetic pulse can be caused by the sun. Uh, what one variety and another variety, an even more severe variety, can be caused by nuclear weapons. So we're going to go over a little bit of how nuclear weapons work. I'm not going to dig in. It's going to be nuclear weapons 101, but. Uh, Essentially, and you've guys probably all seen it before, but uh, you have to compress a mass of either a fissile material, typically uranium-235 or plutonium-239, into a critical mass, which means you compress it into a, a higher density material. And um, they do that by setting off a soccer ball-like ring of ex uh, explosive bridge wire detonators in a high explosive into shaped charges and they basically take a solid piece of metal and crush it down and this here is a remarkable image of what goes on this is an x-ray image of the inside of a nuclear bomb um, this one didn't actually go off the core was lead but this is the implosion you can actually see how it uh, crushes that core into about a piece about half the size, which is kind of amazing. When you think about it, the very first ones were solid metal. They went on a hollow core since. And if you have been living under a rock lately, if you haven't been, you've, you've heard about this guy and his bombs. This is iteration number one, known in the community as the disco ball. <laughs> it is a, a classic, multi-point detonation fission weapon like you just saw and uh, here's another picture of it. it has multiple points where it is detonated and that is your classic atomic bomb um, now there is just to touch on it just in case it ever comes up there's one other way you can set off these type of explosions and it's in a linear implosion mechanism but we're not going to dig too much into that but it only requires two detonators and this allowed us the U.S. to put nuclear bombs in things like recoilless rifles, so you could hold one over your shoulder and shoot it like a bazooka. We put them in everything. We built a lot of these things and artillery shells. But uh, 
This here is what has been in the news lately. And this is a timely talk because it looks as though North Korea has achieved this. I, I try to keep politics out of this, but it scientifically it looks as though they have achieved what is called the Teller Ulam style hydrogen bomb. And that's where you have a primary, which is the standard fission bomb that you saw before that actually sets off a fusion reaction, which in turn does um, the neutrons from the fusion reaction sustain a fission reaction. So it's fission, fusion, fission, very complicated, but fission is the splitting of the atom. Fusion is, is combining two atoms together and releasing energy. Um, this is what it looks like they have achieved. And this Teller Ulam device is named after Edward Teller and Stanislav Ulam. And they were a uh, physicist in the American nuclear program. This is a modern weapon. This thing here, you could uh, pretty easily put in your car and drive off with, probably couldn't pick it up. It's gonna weigh about 500 pounds, 400 pounds, but uh, very small, the entire reentry vehicle for a, a nuclear missile. This is what we have on our submarine launched warheads. And uh, we go down, we can see that uh, over the years, they've really gotten smaller. You know, our first ones were, you know, huge. And then we got, we built some enormous bombs in the 50s. I mean, 15, 20 megaton bombs, they're just enormous. Uh, ones that would wipe out a whole city with one bomb. And then we started to uh, realize that putting these large things on top of an ICBM was impractical. So we, through development and through some of the very first computers, we found out how to simulate these things and make them smaller. And they did. They did a, an amazing job at it, I guess you could say. Um, and they made them quite small. And that brings us to Mr. Peanut here. <laughs> That's what it, these, these things get nicknames on the internet and I didn't name these this, this is just what they've got. But this is the picture of what looks to be the Teller Ulam style. It may not be, you don't know what's inside that case, but whatever they put in the ground the other day really, really shook the ground. Uh, you know, 5.9 to 6.3 or four, earthquake that that's a large explosion so this is a, a significant leap forward for them this is the a comparison on the same scale of all their tests from october of 2006 to the one there on the third and uh it's about nine times 9.8 times almost 10 times larger so it's a, a significant um, test and here they're at 120 kilotons. We measure the yield of these bombs in in thousands of tons or millions of tons of TNT. It's the equivalent of you know if you you had a thousand tons of TNT, that's a lot of TNT, and that that's how these things are measured. And and you know, their first one was around one kiloton, give or take. And then they got up into the 10 or 20 kiloton range, which is expected for a first, first fission style bomb, similar to the very first, the Trinity bomb that, that the U.S. had or, or what was dropped on Japan. Those were 10 to 20 kiloton weapons. It wasn't until a few years later that we got, we figured out hydrogen bombs and, and got into these larger yields. Uh, they are possible, 100 kilotons is possible. I make sure that I put that out there when a purely fission, boosted fission weapon, but I suspect, per my personal belief, is, is that they did build a hydrogen bomb. Um, so that's going to get to the meat of the talk. What, what do we expect from this? And, and there are a lot of threats from these things, and I'm only going to touch on one of them. I'm not going to get into... You know, the effects of nuclear weapons as far as blast or anything like that. This is purely going to be high altitude electromagnetic pulse. And, and we're going to, we're going to stick with that because that is something that you can achieve from, you know, one or, or a few devices can actually achieve a very large area of coverage and do damage, uh, electronic damage. 
uh, typically doesn't harm people directly, but uh, you can do damage with, with a lot less weapons than you could if you actually tried to destroy cities. So that, that's why this is a significant thing, and it's worth knowing, and, and you'll see what to be scared of and what not to be scared of. So we have three types of high-altitude electromagnetic pulse, and we call them three types. Basically, three different time scales of the waveform is what we're looking at here. And uh, E1 is what we call the early time. It is a very fast rising pulse, five nanoseconds to peak voltage. And you're looking at peak voltages of you know 50,000 volts a meter. We have E2, and it comes on in the, you know, the microsecond time scale into the milliseconds. And it, it's more like a lightning bolt. And you're looking at uh, thousands of volts, hundreds to thousands of volts per meter um, of uh, electro electromagnetic field strengths. Um, and the third type is is a interesting type, and it's the E3 or the late time, and it's actually caused by a little different phenomenon, and it's the magnetohydrodynamic or late time EMP. It's a lot easier to remember E3 or late time than magnetohydrodynamic, but uh, it causes a pulse that is very slow in frequency. It goes over, you know, seconds to tens of seconds and uh, even hundreds of seconds. And it, uh, it's an almost like DC like signal. It's in such a low frequency and occurs over such a wide area, but that can have great effects on a power system as we'll see. Um, so E1, like I said um, earlier, it is a, uh, generated by Compton scattering, which is a, a term we're, we'll get into a little bit, but it, the, the takeaway here is in the 30 to 50 kilometer layer of the atmosphere, in the stratosphere, that's where these things are created. So your, your bombs either need to be in or above that layer to, to cause this phenomenon. They, they're not going to cause this type of high altitude EMP. They will cause an EMP, but it won't spread over a great distance like it would if you weren't up high. Um, you know, they have a very fast rise time. You're looking at 50,000 volts a meter, and it's kind of a maximum figure. We're not sure if that's a maximum, but that's, that's sort of the maximum that, that the government's told people that we probably need to deal with. And that's actually 6.6 .6 megawatts per meter if you look at the 277 ohms of free space, so it's a quite a quite a strong pulse. Most of its energy is in the one kilohertz to 10 megahertz spectrum, so great for our HF antennas. I, it will will couple with them quite nicely. Um, there's still a significant amount of power from 10 megahertz to one gigahertz, but the gist of it, the most of it there is in the low end, you know, below 10 megahertz, and they occur in the stratosphere. It's, it's it's up where the ozone layer is. Spy planes fly up there. Weather balloons. Um, and uh, gamma rays are what cause these things. The E1 pulse. And when a nuclear bomb goes off, either you know, 0.3 to 3 percent of the total yield is released as gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is just a shorter wavelength than X-rays. It's a higher energy wave just like radio waves or light um, and they spread out almost isotropically from the bomb so equally in all directions and in turn those come and they they strip electrons off of atoms and there's and when you're up in that rarefied atmosphere up high uh, you've got a lot of lone oxygen atoms and things a lot of things aren't in molecules there aren't a lot of things close together to recombine so you strip these electrons off pretty efficiently and these free electrons line themselves up with the earth's electromagnetic field lines or i mean magnetic field lines and they spin around them and there we go they spin around them and they they produce a form of synchrotron radiation and that radiation as they spin around, they're inducing an oscillating electromagnetic field, and that's what creates the pulse. And that pulse is almost coherent over the entire region, as you can see here. I mean, th this thing happens in 
this all happens at the speed of light. These things spin around at super high velocities and this radiation gets released over a large area. And uh, again, the blast has to be above this line, you know, above, above the uh, 20 to 40, roughly 20 to 50 kilometer range. It, it needs to be in or above that to really create any high altitude E1 electromagnetic pulse or the fast rise time pulse. So the worst case scenario here really for the US is somewhere over the middle of the country, basically right over Omaha, um, which doesn't fare well for where I'm at because I'm right here in the 100% area. But uh, about 480 kilometers up, you can pretty well cover the entire country with a significant pulse. Now, we're not, when we get out on the edge, you know, we're, we're, we're not looking at nearly the full pulse out on the edges here, but this is, it would still be a significant event. Um, this is what these look like. The, the biggest problem I have, or anybody that doesn't have top secret, secret clearance, is, is this, this waveform, this is really kind of the best we have right over here was this reconstructed raid waveform here from Hawaii when they did a test in 1962. Now you can see it only topped out about 5,600 volts per meter. You know, it was not quite that, quite as strong as you would have being in the, the peak area under a peak um, magnetic field strength. Over here, you know, this is an idealized pulse. All we really have are these idealized pulses pulses to go by because first of all there haven't been that many of these things tested there have been a handful maybe two hands full if you take the US and Soviet Union but uh, that data is, seems to remain classified so what we have to go by is what they, they tell us and uh, they say we're gonna get a maximum roughly a maximum of 50,000 volts per meter because as we strip all of those electrons off, those atoms become ionized and start to conduct in that upper atmospheric layer. So they will limit the amount of energy that can be released. So if the gamma rays don't quickly strip those off and create the pulse, that ionization will block any further radiation. So that's what the literature says and, they, and they, the math teams to support it, but there have been some talks about you know, bombs that can produce a super fast, sharp gamma pulse, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this. But just if you want to dig more into it, they call them super EMP weapons and they're kind of hypothetical, worth looking into. Again, here's what this uh, spectral density of EMP looks like versus lightning. See, lightning is a lower frequency pulse, which is to be expected because it's a slower pulse. Um, the EMP is a you know, large pulse and you're looking most of your energy here below 10 megahertz and you slope way off and you basically come back down to the point where you can call it zero up somewhere around a gigahertz. Um, then that brings us back to, you know, I don't want to go out and say this is what the North Korean bomb could do exactly because there are a lot of variables, but, or this is what, you know, any bomb could do for that matter. But these are some of the lines and what you see as far as how much gamma yield. Now remember, gamma yield is a third of a percent to 3% of the total yield. So you, know, you say you have a, a 100 kiloton bomb and you split that down the middle and call it 1.5%. You know, you're looking at uh, 150 tons of yield there. So <clears throat> you've got... Uh, Uh, these curves here that show uh, your, uh, your electro, your, your pulse, your electric field voltage, sorry, in um, volts per meter. And um, this right here is 50,000 volts. And then these curves are different gamma yields. And you can see for uh, uh, 0 0.01 kilotons all the way up to 100 kilotons of gamma yield, which that's a huge bomb. I mean, you we're talking 3% of the total yield here. So uh, it takes a fairly significant bomb to get there, but you know, we're, we're in that range with 
with some of these, you know, if we're looking at 100 kilotons, we're, we're up into this range here. Um, here's another one that shows values at ground zero. And here's your yield in kilotons, gamma yield in kilotons. But you can see that it varies with height. This is different heights of burst. So you can achieve a little higher voltages if you're down lower, but of course you don't cover a wide area. Um, very shortly go over E2. E2 is very similar to lightning. It's just basically the decay of this pulse. And um, it's uh, fairly easy to protect against. Most of most communications facilities, you know, repeaters or, or your cell, cell phone towers and stuff are going to have lightning protection. And it will protect against this E2 pulse. But a lot of that will not protect against the E1. It's just entirely too fast. Um, that brings us to E3. Now, E3 can be produced by a nuclear bomb. We call it E3, magnetohydrodynamic EMP. And it can also be generated by a solar event, a coronal mass ejection. Again, this talk was timely because just the other day we had a large CME that's arriving about right now. And uh, you're probably happy you're here listening to this instead of trying to get on the HF bands because they're probably not working. <laughs> um, it's a pretty big radio blackout when I looked before. I got on here, but uh, your E3, uh, we would call it E3 if it was from a nuclear bomb. We would call it uh, you know, geomagnetically induced current if it was from a solar event, but they're, they're very similar in nature. And it's formed by, a, when the nuclear bomb goes off, you've got a magnetic bubble that formed, um, and it, it spreads out, and then this, this blast wave actually pushes the magnetic field lines of the Earth out slowly. And as they move out, they're moving magnetic fields, so they create voltage. And then as that collapses and raises up from heating, they also produce voltage. Now, the voltage is much lower than the Eve one, much lower. You're looking at uh, uh, volts per kilometer here on the left. So you're looking at 40 volts per kilometer. You know, that's, that's millivolts per meter. Um, much lower, but it is a much slower rise time. So the frequency in turn is a lot lower and it can be induced on things like power line neutrals and pipelines and railroad tracks, things that are very long. Uh, you can almost think of it as a VLF type signal. You're, you're talking in the kilohertz, the, the, the tens of kilohertz in frequency and into the single digit kilohertz in frequency, if not lower. Um, this graph here shows what a, kind of gives you an op an optimal sizing, I guess if you were, were thinking about uh, planning for EMP. So you can see that uh, this is the actual yield in kilotons versus the, uh, and this is not gamma yield, this is the total yield. And you can see that you can get an E1 from a small bomb or a large bomb. You get, you get, you can cover a larger area and so on. But your E3, you really need to get into this 100 kiloton range to get into that, uh, the E3 range to really push the, you know, get a big enough bubble of energy that pushes those magnetic field lines out of the way. So, uh, you know, a small bomb down to, 10 kilotons up into the, we're talking megatons and tens of megatons range up here can produce E1, but it takes a larger bomb, over a little over 100 kilotons to really produce significant E3. Here is a uh, image of the E3 being created. It's a kind of an expanding ball of plasma that just gets pushed up and pushes the field lines out of the way. As those field lines move, you get this ionized area, but you get the moving field lines, and that, you know, if, if you're moving a magnetic field, you get energy, you kind of get a compression effect, and then you get this hot patch that rises up over time. And over that whole time effect, you get these little bumps in the waveform here at the end of the E3 pulse. <clears throat> 
So the sun, just to recap, it can only produce the slower magnetohydrodynamic or late time style EMPs. It's not going to make an E1 pulse. It's not going to, the sun itself is not going to cause, you know, your radio to fry or anything if it's just by itself I and mean, it's plugged into the power line, you could have some problems. But the sun is not going to create this fast time pulse that is, you know, super fast, super hard to protect um, electronics from. It can, in turn, though, create a lot of problems for the power distribution, the power grids, the uh, gas company, you know, pipelines, the water lines, uh, petroleum pipelines, railroad tracks even. Anything that is very long antenna, whether it's grounded or not, this can really cause havoc with it. Um, it's a picture I took the other day before the eclipse here. Um, so the sun will cause an E3 like EMP. There will be, it will happen. It has happened in the past. It will happen in the future. It's a virtual certainty. Um, and what happens in this case, instead of the bomb blowing up and out and, and moving your field lines, you basically get this big wave of energy that comes off the sun and it just compresses those field lines down. And those field lines have to rebound. And when that happens, when you get that compression and rebound effect, you get moving magnetic field, you get the voltage again. Um, you can do a little math on it, but you end up with about that same range, maybe a little less. This one comes up right here and says 20 millivolts a meter, which is 20 volts per kilometer, which is right there in the same order. And it, the thing about this is it can affect the entire side of the earth that, that that ion patch hits. And some of it can even wrap around up towards the top because you get, you know, the, the field lines come in towards the poles. So uh, the, these tend to affect the high latitudes a lot more than the low latitudes. Um, as with the major cases of problems with them, Canada, Northern Europe, Russia, they historically have had the problems with them. 20 millivolts a meter, you know, it's a small value compared to that 50,000 volts a meter you've got to look for for E1. Um, but it does add up on long conductors. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a real problem for the electric power companies and the power grid. And the main reason is because all these large transformers at substations are auto transformers. They have this center tap neutral and you can get what's called geomagnetic induced current, which flows through the earth in one direction and then returns back through that neutral um, star point in those transformers. And it saturates the transformers and you know, if, if it was just that current flowing through, you wouldn't have a problem. But you're also trying to meet demand. So half the half the AC cycle, you're you're saturating your transformer. The other half, you're not. And it, if you've ever put DC into a transformer, you know it causes bad things. Um, two Briggs capacitors leaking. I mean, bad things happen. This is a case in point. This is damage to a transformer. Damage is not directly caused by the GIC current, the geomagnetically induced current. It's really caused by the AC. But, uh, the you know, the geomagnetically induced current gets in there and saturates these transformer windings, and they just, the magnetic field can collapse. The magnetic field can go through the metal case instead of through the core. It can cause all kinds of weird effects. Harmonics can build up. I mean, you can have all kinds of bad things happen when you put DC through a, a transformer that's almost at capacity anyway. And our grid is run pretty much at capacity most of the time. I mean, you know, evenings and this time of year, it's a lot lower capacity than it will be during the cold and hot, hottest parts of the year. But we run things pretty close to the top and right at capacity. So this kind of thing has happened. This was in 1989. Um, the Hydro-Quebec grid collapsed. The biggest solar storm that we know about, at least as far as human recent history that has affected us because we had electric devices, was the 1859 Carrington event. It caused aurora as far south as um, Havana, Cuba. They said you could read by aurora light 
in the mid latitudes, read newspapers at night. It set numerous telegraph stations on fire. I mean, it, it was a very large storm. Um, we had another large storm that was in uh, 2003 that caused problems. Those same ionized particles caused issues with satellites. In July 2012, we had a storm that they think was just as powerful as that 1859 event, but it shot off the side of the sun and it didn't hit Earth. And the NASA document said that it could have, if it would have, it would have caused $2 trillion in damage and likely resulted in total grid collapse. So we'll add one more to the list now, and that was yesterday. And we had a, a very large, it was an X9 uh, class flare from the sun, a big CME, and it's hitting now. It's probably not going to cause any damage at our latitude. There's probably going to be some instability issues up north, but they, since 89, they've really strengthened their grid. They've took neutral isolators on their transformers. Um, DC blocking neutral isolators, it's a way you can get around it. So I suspect we'll probably weather this storm just fine. Um, the biggest problem with this whole event isn't the fact that transformers are hard to build or that we don't know how to build them. It's that they don't build that many of these big transformers. And they are heavy. They cost a fortune. They cost a fortune to get moved into place. And we only have a few thousand of them here in the U.S. And there aren't very many backups. I mean, I don't know if you've driven around and look at substations. And next time you drive around and you see one, look around and see. I mean, every transformer that's sitting in there, for the most part, is in service. I mean, it may be a hot spare, but it, it's connected in some way or another. Um, and there aren't too many even hot spares out there. So you don't see too many of these things lying around. You might drive by an electrical company and there's one or two sitting in a yard as a backup. And they typically have those in case you have a tornado or in hurricane areas. They're going to have some spares, but there aren't enough of them. If you broke a significant portion of them in this country, we would be out of luck. Um, all right, come on. There we go. That shows a very large one there. That's a big uh, <clears throat> 345 to 138 kV transformer. And the shipping bill on that's got to be quite high. And the lead time to get something like that made is it's five to six years. And at one point, they weren't making them in the U.S. anymore, which is kind of crazy. But they have started making them here again. And they need special rigs to get them in place. I mean, this is kind of an extreme event, but you know, that, that costs a lot of money to get it there, and it's specialized equipment. And if you needed these all at once, supply could not meet demand. So let's kind of go over the total results here of what would happen with a nuclear EMP. The sun could certainly cause us problems. It could cause grid problems and likely will cause grid problems at some point. <clears throat> Could cause total collapse of the grid. It might not. It depends on the, the scale of the CME. Um, when it comes to nuclear EMP, it's a little different animal, so let's, let's get into the effects of it. Now, there was the famous EMP commission report that came out that estimate, estimates that nine in 10 Americans would die within two years of a major high altitude EMP attack. Um, I can't first tell you if this is correct or not. Uh, you know, that that's making a lot of assumptions, but uh, we're not prepared for something like this. We just aren't. Um, but again, should we put the money into preparing for EMP? Should we put the money into missile defense? I mean, I, these are questions that I can't answer. <laughs> I, I'm into the science. I'm not into the politics of the situation. Um, there are so many myths, go, myths about EMP going around. and any, Both types of EMP. The biggest one that's going around, and it's not on my list. I should have put it on here. Is Well, I guess it is on here. Solar storms cause the same EMP as a nuclear weapon. It should be at the top because they don't. They're, they're a different animal. Yes, a nuclear weapon will cause solar-like EMP at the end of its pulse, but that E1 pulse is a lot more to deal with than that E3 pulse. So you, that, 
differentiating that in the media has not come out very well. It just, it just hasn't filtered down to the public well. The other thing is, is that all the cars are going to stop. I don't think that that's going to happen. And, and the, the EMP commission did some testing and found that uh, I think they took 37 cars and one of them stopped working to the point where they had to, to have damage. The rest of them basically needed to be, uh, most of them kept going. I should have the numbers here, but like five of them, all they needed to do was be turned off and turned back on. And they were fairly modern cars as of 2003. Of course, things have progressed since. Uh, portable electronics, cell phones, walkie-talkies, two-way, you know, handheld radios. You know, most of those things are, are made to survive crazy electric fields because they're electronic magnetic compliance. Um, and I think a lot of those would survive. Whether the infrastructures that supported the cell phones would or not, that's a whole different story. The military is not hardened all the way for EMP, especially the tactical systems. The strategic systems are well hardened and well backed up, but the tactical systems are not. The big buzzword around the military for years was common off the shelves. And they do test a lot of it, but again, you know, you can't, you really just can't harden everything, especially in a modern military like we've got. You have to take some risk and you have to uh, balance risk and cost with, with, you know, in certain situations. And, you know, you have to be a military planner, which I am not. Um, uh, yeah, a nuclear weapon in an airplane will not cause an EMP. They're not high enough. I fully suspect that airplanes flying in the sky would survive just fine. They are well hardened for um, electromagnetic compliance and lightning strikes. And they're basically a flying Faraday cage for the most part. So this brings us to the ham radio portion, you know, to really get into it. Um, traditionally, ham radio has been the the last resort of when all else fails, as they always say, we're there because we can adapt and overcome in a situation. And this is one of those situations where if we're going to adapt and overcome, we need to know what the risks are. Um, check my time here. I'm going good. So the big thing here is, you know, are we going to be able to pick up the pieces? And, and a lot more has to happen here than, hey, did my radio survive? Are, are we going to be able to feed ourselves? Our ham club going to have enough food to continue to operate if we had a massive disaster? And it doesn't have to be EMP. It could be anything. I Pick a massive disaster off the, the list of your, your darkest memories. Pick one out and think about it. If you're going to go out and provide communications, you've got to have food. You've got to have water. If your family's not safe, you're probably not going to be out chatting on the radio and helping people. You're probably going to help them. There's a lot of things you got to think about beyond radio. And that's where I think a lot of ham clubs uh, failure to imagine maybe. Uh, and it's a, you don't you don't want to think about this stuff every day. It's not something you want to think about, but uh, it's a it's a hard case. It's a very hard decision and and what do we do but some of those things i can't answer for you some of those you'll have to answer as a club um we've talked about them a little bit with our club but i'll be honest with you we're by no means probably any better off than you are but uh knowing the problem is the first step so protecting the average ham station from e1 emp is while it's connected and operating, if you leave your rig connected all the time, it's virtually impossible on the on the average amateur radio budget. <laughs> Most of us are not millionaires and we can't spend money buying all of this protection. But backing, you know, taking equipment in, in that you have stored as a club or or is a you know a races or Aries association and keeping that instead of in a normal pelican case, you can spray the inside of the pelican case with a conductive paint. That will protect you like a Faraday cage. Um, there are things you can do. You you can disconnect your radios when they're not in use. If the radio is just sitting there by itself without a wire at all connected to it, 
that includes mic cables, anything that can pick up 100 megahertz, you know, that doesn't take a very long cable. If nothing's connected to a radio, it should survive just fine. I can't guarantee it, but it, it's going to be a lot better off than it's got, you know, a half wave 30 meter dipole hooked to it because <laughs> that's going to be perfect for 10 megahertz um, and below, you know, 40 meters, 80 meters, 160, those are going to get huge voltages on them. Um, now E3 and solar storms, they're not gonna they're not gonna fry your equipment directly. Now, if it's plugged in, you might have some problems, but mostly most likely you're probably just gonna lose power. So that shouldn't be a problem. And you know, uh, so how much voltage are we actually looking at dealing with with these threats? Well, E1, and this depends on what you read, and this this is not an easy question. I mean, this gets into modeling the antenna system and modeling every wire in your ham shack, and that's pretty hard to do because every wire is going to act as an antenna, the mutual inductances and capacitance, it, you know, who knows. But this was in a, a, a Mars document that the National Communication System put out in the 80s, and it was saying that, you know, the average DC strike over, so your cable will arc at four to six volts, four to six kilovolts, sorry. Um, I don't know if I buy that, because I've seen a lot more voltage put through RG8, but, you know, somewhere in there, if you're not talking about the cable itself, if you're talking about the connectors in the radio, through the termination resistor, through the antenna, through the, you know, you might not fry the entire radio. You might just get the something right in the front end. It's hard to say. But if you're looking at, at total system, yeah, I, I would say you're probably looking at four to 6,000 volts at your radio port. Um, and again, it depends on what you read. I mean, Another another article here says uh, you're looking at 100 kilovolts on a on an HF width one and a half meters long at 400 kiloamps. Of course, that's open circuit and short circuit voltages, 100 joules of energy, which really isn't a tremendous amount of energy. Because remember, this is a very short pulse. The biggest thing is is that everything is an antenna. If your system's grounded properly, it is going to help. Anything you do to prevent lightning damage is going to help this. MOVs and such are not always going to be fast enough. Some gas discharge tubes can be fast enough in, in certain devices, but a lot of the lightning protection coaxial devices are not fast enough. Um, handheld radios, again, they're, they're, they're a tough breed. I mean, I, I, we've got a repeater site that's on an AM tower and I recently always have a handheld and, and that repeater right there at the base of that hot AM tower that's fed with 10,000 watts and never had a problem. My car's never stopped working. <laughs> you know, it's a little different. It's not this fast broadband pulse, but you're in a high field strength parked right up next to that thing. And they seem to make it. Of course, it's, it's way lower in frequency. You know, there's going to be a significant component up at 144 megahertz. But I still think that they're going to be much less likely to be damaged. I mean, look at how inefficient a HD antenna is anyway. You know, now if your HD is hooked to a 10 element beam, then you can write it off. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just with the hand, the, the whip antenna that's on it, it, it's got a good chance of surviving, especially since it doesn't really have a path for anything. It, it's just kind of floating, you know. Depends on where it's sitting. If it's sitting on a nice grounded surface, it might be gone. If it's sitting on a wooden floor and it's all by itself, it may not end up with that much energy in it. It's really hard to say. It might be the opposite just because of a reflection or something. But again, the only thing you can really do to protect your equipment from E1 EMP, if the levels are what the government tells us at 50,000 volts a meter, is to put it in a Faraday cage. Um, and it goes over grounding, you know, ground your single point, but that's the only thing you can really do. Get it in a Faraday cage, slide out of order here. Um, some of the other things you can do here is, uh, we'll touch back on Faraday cages in a second, but, uh, um, some of the other things you can do here is you can, um, use TVS diodes and I put these on my uh, power supply. I'll show you some here at the end. I've got them laying here next to me, but they're a fast diode that can clamp fast enough. And they have a 
AC version you can use. It's got the common shared cathode. Um, but I put them on my DC power supply right at the output. It can't hurt anything. <laughs> um, I guess it could, but uh, it hasn't. Um, I've never had a scenario where I've had a problem. I typically put a 20 volt one on there. Um, in a car, I don't know that if I'd want to put a 20 volt one because of all the weird spikes and things that happen when you're starting the car, you'd probably burn that diode up pretty quick. But, um, you know, that's what I, I've got on my power supply. Um, uh, little fuse has a, a nice easy, mo um, serial numbering scheme where you can see that the, they've got this 1.5 K series and they've got the, uh, a for the single directional and um, CA for bi-directional or the AC type. And uh, I use the 20 for the 12 volt and you could use uh, you could use these on, on AC lines. Of course, take any precautions, do it at your own risk. Um, it's got to be fused. You've got to have something if the thing clamps to, you know, to stop or it's just going to explode because of the AC. Um, gas discharge tubes, uh, a lot of them are a little bit too slow to, to shunt all of your E1 pulse, but, uh, some of them can turn on and it depends on which ones you get and you just need to read the data sheets on what you're getting or buy something that's specifically for this, but they're cheap and they're easy to install. They've got a low capacitance and I put them in antenna tuners and I've got them in my antenna tuners. I, they're not huge. They're right here. Um, I've got them between ground and each leg. They're 800 volt strike over. I don't run high power. And so I don't have a problem with that. You know, with your uh, not knowing what the VSWR of your antenna is, knowing the voltage at those output ports, especially using a tuner is, uh, <clears throat> is a little difficult, but uh, I went with 800 volts and I haven't had them strike over yet with 100 watts. Now, if I put 1500 watts through it and I had a mismatched antenna, they would strike over. Um, that uh, is a given. <laughs> that brings me on to the next one here with the MOVs, which we all have laying around everywhere and every power strip's got one stuck in there for better or for worse. I, uh, seen some nice properly designed lightning protection equipment that combines MOVs with line filters that have saved thousands of dollars worth of uh, computer equipment. And I've seen some cheap, cheap, very cheap, uh, just got an MOV or two stuck across the, the, the mains leads, uh, power strips that absolutely did nothing. And the whole thing was burnt and black and, you know, MOVs never fired or they weren't MOVs. They may just look like them. You don't know anymore with, with some of this stuff where it was made, you know? So MOVs are one of those things that they're not fast enough. Even the good ones, even the, the properly built rated ones are not going to be fast enough for E1. Um, but they will protect your E2 and, and right after E1 comes E2. So they're not a bad thing to have. Typical surge suppressing Power strips all have those in them. Um, again, UPS systems are going to be better than in your normal power strip. Line active UPS, where the voltage comes in, gets converted to DC, back to AC. Those are going to be better yet. You know, there's there's some things you can do. Jokes and filters are really kind of the mainstay um, of this. And I've done a little modeling, but I in LT spice and whatnot on this subject. It's a difficult subject and there's not a lot about it on the net. Most of the protection brings you back to uh, gas discharge tubes and stuff. But these, if done right, should provide a pretty significant amount of protection um, combined with other technologies. But, uh, you know, your typical line filter, your AC line filter has a circuit, something like that. And, um, nope. They look like you'll see them in a lot of equipment, and um, they, uh, if you're pulling them out of old uh, boat anchors, they're worth having. Um, 
Maybe they might not be in, in the actual radios, but there's a lot of computer stuff now that I would call boat anchors. I guess the, the modern boat anchors for people my age that have them. And uh, they're worth pulling out of there. I, I found piles of these things at Hamfest for nothing. And, you know, with anything, they, they definitely help out on keeping the uh, uh, HF out of everything. You know, you got that piece of coax that never fails and it radiates inside your, your ham shack. Well, these help a lot and they should provide some protection. Uh, here's a homebrew one, <clears throat> similar, just a uh, similar, similar setup. You know, you've got uh, differential and common mode chokes and some suppression caps and, and there's, there's easier ways to, you can make one, but you can certainly buy one. They're, they're probably almost not worth making as much equipment that has them on there. There we go. So things must have got out of order here, but we're back to Faraday cages. And probably the, the biggest thing to know about a Faraday cage is it's probably your only real insurance against this fast rise time E1 EMP. A uh, metal trash can from Tractor Supply does wonders. It's amazing. Um, I've put a two meter HT inside of one and turned the squelch off and turned the volume all the way up, put it in there keyed up next to it and could just, if I got the transmitting radio right next to the lid where that little slot was, I could get it to come through. And that's a lot of isolation. I mean, your, your normal handheld to go down to negative 100 or something, negative 120. And you're pumping out a couple watts, four watts on battery power, five watts. You know, it's a, it's a, significant amount of attenuation and that's even without putting the metal uh, aluminum flashing tape around the top a lot of people swear by that tape i think that you're probably going to get your 40 db of isolation that you're looking for with one without it and i have not been able to get even the closest i've got a fm station about a mile away and they're a pretty high power station 103.5 megahertz and i can't hear it inside there with a proper you know, measurement receiver. I, I just don't even see it inside a trash can. So it's kind of amazing how well it actually works. Um, that uh, MG Chemicals makes a conductive paint that I saw just the other day. I didn't have time to get it in here, but people are 3D printing antennas and they're painting them with this nickel conductive paint. And that to me sounds like an ideal method to, to take your normal Pelican cases or go boxes spray paint the insides and uh, maybe put a protective coating over top of that and you've got a ready-made faraday cage it's it's not cheap it's like 30 40 dollars a spray can but you should only need one and it's a pretty good insurance um there and also if you're having any kind of emi or you know, rfi issues it can certainly can't hurt that the the old uh, 50 caliber ammo can I don't know about duct tape. I think I'd much rather use the aluminum flashing tape. It's going to do a much better job, but hey, there's one. Um, here's the metal trash can. This is one I got on the net, but I've got one just like this that I've tried out, and it it works great. Some people swear by the cardboard on the insides. So you're not touching the outside, but that should not matter, knowing that the skin effect exists, and most of the RF should pretty much all the RF should stay on the outside. So uh, I don't know. I kind of put like the cardboard in there just so things don't bang up against the sides as much. Um, you got your shielding effectiveness here, and this is just a little, little thing I've showed. But, you know, you take off 40 dBs, and you're, you're down about 500 volts. And, and you go down to 80 v, dB and you're down to 5 volts. But even at 500 volts a meter, you're probably not going to have any problems. So, you know, that's that's a voltage of a <clears throat> being in the, you know, two two handhelds in the same room. One of them is exposed to that kind of voltage. So uh, pretty close if you're maybe not the same room, but if you're pretty close to one another, it happens. It happens all the time and things survive. So um, you have to power your station somehow post disaster post EMP is not just for EMPs, but uh, solar panels themselves are kind of a delicate, you know, they're a, a silicon junction. So they can be damaged. Keeping a bunch of solar panels, at least rigid ones inside of a Faraday cage gets to be a little difficult. 
but uh, you know, uh, you could make something happen. You could wrap it in foil. I don't know. There's a lot of things you could do, but they they can be damaged. Most generators, at least non-inverter generators, non you know little Honda inverter type generators, will survive. They're <laughs> most of them are pretty beefy. Some of them do have some solid state stuff in them. You know, a lot of them are just like a fixed resistor and a, a arm that sets the idle and a little solenoid and feedback type deal. They're they're fairly simple. Um, so most of those will survive. Uh, inverter generators are a whole different story. They're chock full of electronics. They're probably shielded quite well just because they have to be electromagnetically compliant and not radiate RF everywhere because they're essentially a big switch mode power supply. Um, so they would probably do okay. Again, the EMP commission says most cars will survive. I happen to believe that. Again, you can prepare either way, but cars have to go through some very strict electromagnetic compliance testing. You know, you just don't want a car to stop working the first time it gets in the, the beam of a radar or in a um, in close lightning hit or even, you know, there, there's many things that, that they have to make sure that this doesn't happen. The other thing they have to make sure that happens is that all those data lines that are in a modern car, all that CAN bus network doesn't radiate RF everywhere. They've got exposure limits and, and radiation limits they have to go by and that all involves shielding. But uh, it's they're not perfect. I fully suspect some cars will have problems. Um, and it doesn't take all the cars on an interstate or on a highway to really cause a big problem. You know, you, you get 5% of the cars at rush hour traffic in a city have a problem. You've got a real problem on your hands. You know, you've got gridlock. So that's uh, something to think about. Uh, batteries shouldn't be a problem. You know, lead acid batteries, you can't hurt lead acid battery with this stuff. Um, some lithium ion batteries, if they're just sitting there by themselves, they're not going to be big enough antenna size, aperture size to really collect any voltage. But uh, some lithium ion batteries got that those protection circuits in them, and uh, rightly so, they need those. But um, I don't have any information on that. I just thought of that when I was reading back over this from the last time I gave it. That lithium ions do have those protection circuits in them, so. You know, be advised. Um, the bottom line, if you want to use it post EMP, just like anything else, you know, you, you need to, you, you got to keep it safe. So if you know, keep it in a Faraday cage, that's an option. I know for a lot of us, you get to the end of this thing and this was this way when I gave this pr presentation before, you mean I got to buy another HF radio? You mean I got to do this? Well, no, I I think that maybe the club, in a club environment, it would be nice to have some spare equipment. Um, it would be good for people to get in the habit of unplugging their radios completely. I know with radios anymore, you know, you're doing your WSJT and your PSK, it's hooked to your computer, it's hooked to your, your keyer, and it's hooked to your antenna, and then, you know, you've got thousand cables coming into the radio anymore you might have a remote head on it there's just a lot of things that go into these radios and people don't want to unhook it and i understand that and i know a lot of people that don't do it until they hear the thunder coming oh i better go and hook my radio but i don't know if you're not in there using it you can come up with a way to probably unhook it if if you're it depends on how active you are. I'm not on the radio all the time, so for me, it's not a problem. I've got people in the club that are on it constantly, and if you're going to use it all the time, I'd rather you use the radio all the time than worry about unhooking it because we need people that know how to operate as well. So it's just one of these things that you're going to have to come to a, a decision on what you want to do. Um, unfortunately, I can't answer it. This brings me back to one more thing that gets forgotten a lot, and that's food and provisions, water, whatever, shelter, post-disaster, any disaster, and you need to think about this if, if you're looking at any disaster. Uh, I live in Pittsburgh, Kansas. We had the Joplin tornado a few years ago. I live 20 miles from that. I was there that day. I mean, that was a, a big disaster, but the entire half of the city survived, you know, like 
the whole northern part of the city survived. We had access to food, water, and shelter. We, there was a place to take people afterwards. A whole hospital was gone, but there was another hospital that survived. You know, but what, what would happen if there wasn't anywhere to take anybody? What if people weren't so friendly? To, you know, I mean, people are going to be panicked. It's a, these are things I can't answer for you, but just keep them in mind, you know. Uh, being able to communicate in a world without communications is going to be huge, especially in a world where we rely on communications constantly. I mean, constantly, and I'm 36. I can't imagine the next generation. I mean, we're relying on communications to a point that is never before in human history. So being able to communicate in a, in a situation where communications are down is going to make you somebody that is a VIP, and your skills will be needed. Um, I think that... You know, to put it all together, HF radio, power supply, antenna, solar panel, batteries, tuner, Faraday cage, that would be awesome if everybody can do that. And I know everybody can't do that. I don't even, I can't do that. Um, I have some of that. I have an old HF radio and, you know, that tube radios, I don't think you're going to hurt them. I really just don't think anything is going to hurt them um, in those, you know, maybe if they're hooked up to an antenna at the time, but you Tube radios should survive. The problem is powering them afterwards. Uh, they're a little difficult to power. I know there are some of those uh, ones that'll run on, on uh, DC, but you need like 120 volts DC. So uh, you know, they, I'm not a tube aficionado. I'm only 36, so I, they were not uh, not prevalent when I got into radio. But uh, they they they're a very tough um, deal. They'll survive. Um, 72 hour bag ready to go just FEMA recommends that for everybody in the US I was until I read about you know got into this and and really looked into it I was surprised that they actually recommend that for everybody but they really do and I can see why in here in the Midwest most people have that around here I mean we're out in the country people have pantries people have gotten we're not really in the country but we're kind of in the middle of nowhere out here, and a lot of people have that. I mean, I have it in a bag, but they have the, the provisions. Um, just don't forget about the non-output, or but the non-radio aspects. Uh, you can't operate your radio if you can't eat and drink, and if you're not safe, and if you're not, uh, you just can't do it. So for the clubs, I added this little bit in. Everybody hates these little radios, these bow things, and some people love them, whatever, but they're cheap. They're extremely cheap, and you can get 10 or 20 of them and just put them away and forget about them. Um, I don't think after something like this, anybody's going to really care about type certification, so those radios may not even get used by the ham club. They may go straight to the police department and get programmed up on some governmental frequency and go. I mean, it there's things that can be done in these events, in these environments. I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating, at, you know, going around a law or anything and breaking the rules, but necessity in a, in a bad situation really outweighs some of these, these, these rules. So, you know, there are some other things you have to think about. Um, don't forget to rig up some cheap way to charge these things. I've done it before for some of our field stuff with these, LM 2596 buck converter modules. They're like a dollar. They're probably, you probably get them for 50 cents shipped. Uh, so they're simple and you can use them to get the 8.4 volts you need to put into that, the battery, the little charger base for those, those UV five R type radios. But uh, that's kind of what my recommendation is. And this leaves it back to discussion. So, Let's uh, see if we got any questions from anybody here. Um, I'm going to go back. Where am I at here? Stop. That's the button. All right. Here we are. So uh, I'm going to take some questions from anybody. I, I can't easily pull the PowerPoint up and see what you're saying. I think I can hear, though. So if I need to pull it back up and show a slide again, I can. So. Okay, let's give this a try here. Yeah. 
I did all right on time, even. I thought I was going to go way over, just a little bit over. <clears throat> did great. Right. Hey, anybody have any questions? Questions? Anybody? <laughs> great presentation. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Yeah, so sometimes I have a habit of talking a little fast when it's just me right here and and going in front of a, a PowerPoint. But I hope I hope it all went okay. Um, thank you guys for uh, listening and being in everything. I wish I could have been there in person. I would have enjoyed it. So, I, anybody got any questions? No discussion. I, I think you answered all the questions. They're they're all giving me. Blank stairs like they got it all, and they're they're gonna go give the presentation tomorrow. I think you know. Okay, well, <laughs> again, you can watch this again. It'll be online. I'll get the link to you, and uh, I, you know, it's just one of these things that I don't want anybody to be super scared about this. I don't think there's any reason to be ab, you know, irrationally worried about it. I, I, it's just some, you know, knowing is the first part of preparing, and. It's one of those things that we have as hams have the technical skills to overcome and we should make sure that we've got some spares, some backups and, and are ready to go in case there is an emergency. So thanks a lot. And I guess uh, I, <laughs> that's all I've got. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll go ahead and end this then, yep. if that's good with you. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot. Have a good night. I'll look, I'll look forward to that link, and I'll get that posted on our website. Will do. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yep. All right, everybody listening online, um, I think there's a chat here somewhere, so hang on. I'm coming for you. No, no I don't want to watch myself. Um, that. Stop and there. Live chat. Hello. Works. So, does anybody have any questions on here? <clears throat> I can answer them if uh, I'll try, but uh, should be on the right side of what you're viewing there. So, all right. Well, I don't see anything. I don't see anybody even in the chat. So. Thanks a lot. We'll see you guys. I'm going to, this will be up on the uh, Ham Prepper uh, YouTube page so you can watch it at any time. Spread it around. Hopefully, I didn't go overboard or talk too fast. So, have a good night. Thanks for watching. <laughs>